Right, Executive Governor of Bayasa State, Dr. Sereki Dixon, welcome to TVC News. Thank you for having me. Right. Now, first, let me, let me start this way. Uh, we just went through recession as a country in Nigeria, and a lot of states, it was so obvious how the recession knocked them down. But Bayasa kept soaring high and high. What is the magic wand in Bayasa State that made it different through the recession until now? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't believe that we are completely out of the recession. But there are encouraging signs of improvement on that front uh, for which uh, we, are, we are grateful. The oil price is beginning to pick up. Production has stabilized for some time. Uh, and um, I think things are picking up gradually. But you are right. I went through, um, I think from what historians say, the worst recession in the past 25, 30 years that this country has experienced. And I must tell you, it was tough, very, very tough. For most states, very tough for our country. Um, the, it was very challenging for me as governor uh, because I came with these big ideas and big programs and big projects and they had a, a lifespan. I mean, in my place, before you construct anything, you have to first um, create land. I mean, it's as graphic as you have to create land before you put anything on top. And the normal gestation period for a number of these big ticket projects, where, and we're talking of massive roads and bridges and buildings and other forms of investment, is three, four years, and so on. And uh, the recession came, and I had just rolled out an ambitious program of uh, infrastructural, uh, massive investments in infrastructure, and investments in every sector. And then suddenly, boom, the recession came. I had just started in, after one year, uh, after 2013, it started coming in. But the worst was 2015 and particularly 2016. It's a miracle that uh, uh, we got out of, we managed that uh, period. And so a number of challenges came up, which I never thought I was going to deal with. Issues of whether the government will be able to meet up salary payments at the end of a month. I mean, because we are dealing with a rural state, a new state, one of the newest. And yet, one of the most difficult terrains you have, most backward in terms of development, because it was a forgotten forest that General Basha carved out and made a state. And in the middle of nowhere, we had to bring about development. And here we started, and the recession came. So it was very, very tough. In my first tenure, I never owed salaries because I take that very seriously. Um, but when the recession came and my state with a wage bill, state wage bill at that time of about close to five billion. Um, and I have very serious issues about the wage bill. I've always had. Uh, so it was very tough. And then some months we're now getting three billion, four billion, five billion. And you had pending liabilities from the previous government that I took over from and a number of situations we are managing. So it was really tough, really tough. But we thank God um, we are experiencing uh, signs of a recovery, no matter how slow. Um, and uh, we are grateful for that. But all in all, uh, with the focus and a competent team, because I keep telling people, governance at any level, political service at any level. It's teamwork. I am leader of a team, an efficient team, a proactive team, a prudent team, and a team that never takes eyes off the ball. Uh, so the measures we have put in place and our consistency uh, and prudence, above all, uh, has helped us um, come thus far. Okay. Well, let me, let me start with some of the sectors that uh, we have seen some very 
massive development. Let me start with education. You have Africa University, there are so much, there's so much investment in secondary education, also in primary education. What's your vision for education generally and why are you deciding to invest so much in education now? Well, first of all, that I've always said that the most important challenge facing my people, my state, the Niger Delta, and in fact even the country, well, even though some areas of the country are more, uh, have more advantages than others. But essentially, I take the issue of investment in human capital very seriously. And I believe that that ought to be the foundation of any meaningful and lasting development. Because everything else you do is about the human being, the human being. So how do we increase the capacity of this human being to live as effective a life as possible, as responsible a life that is possible, a life that understands its mission a life that can serve its people, a life that can contribute to the progress and development of that. It's only true capacity building. And I saw a massive deficit in that, in my state, for example. And I've been in the trenches. I've been involved in the state for a long time. And, uh, and that's why grooming is important. That's why grooming is important. It's important for people to be, ex to be exposed to the challenges of their societies in a systematic way so that when they occupy certain high, very sensitive offices, they don't suffer a shock, you know, and be in want of a coherent mission. So I came prepared for that. I knew the challenges. So right from the inauguration venue, I was very clear that with me as governor, that state we're going to have massive investments in human capacity building, meaning schools, schools, and more schools. So with, with, with that massive investment in building more schools and you know, changing the structures and, and so on, and even motivating staff, yes. what has changed in the school enrollment? What, what has school been enrollment been has so improved significantly. And now where we are is that we even take the children from, the, from their parents. Um, we are building boarding schools all over, and the whole idea, because we are dealing with a crisis, it's not a normal situation. And any society that suffers from, um, that has issues with law and order, that has challenges of stability, um, you should know that the first thing to consider is investment in capacity. Because if people are educated, they, have access, they will have access. The chances are they will either have the capacity to employ themselves or even employ others. They will be in a position to, you know, go through competitive uh, employment procedures and processes and so on and so forth. And a well-educated young man or woman will not have anything to do holding an AK-47 rifle in a forest for days on end in a camp, waiting to kidnap an 80-year-old man or woman to make a living out of it. Uh, you can call them any name, but the truth is that they themselves are victims of the society. And for you to break that evil circle of criminality, of militancy, if you call it that way, and uh, of unemployment, and even unemployability, that fuels is an evil circle. It goes around and around. When they are not educated, they have no jobs. When they are not, you know, jobs, there's restiveness. When there's restiveness, there's, military. there's an upsurge in crime wave. There's a tendency for drug abuse. So all of these things that fuel social unrest and crisis, you address them on the long term by investments in education. And what we have done is to build schools, in all schools, in all areas, local government areas, some local governments have two, and we have designated some of them to say, look, these are model boarding schools, which are there, and then we have taken the children from their parents to say, bring your child. The child becomes government property. We feed them three times a day. Three times a day. They have free books. 
and we give them education and they are treated as human beings and I emphasize this all the time it is good for us to uh, bring out the humanity in our people in our young people so that they feel important have a sense of mission and will be uh, will be available to contribute that course. So that's what is going on. It's a massive revolution going on. All right. Now, there, there, is a, there is a move by the state to reduce medical tourism abroad. Yes. And that's, that's warranted your massive investment in health. Talk to us about that. What, what has really changed? We, at, at the time we saw news made around, in fact, there were TV, re, TV reports and all of that. The former uh, president, Olusha Gabasunjo, was in your state, and he made a categorical statement that uh, he is going to be coming to Bayasa State. Oh, yes. Talk to us about that. Already we are seeing an influx of people, Nigerians from across the, the, across the nation, coming to Bayelsa for one medical um, issue or the other. And that's very good. That's what we want. And we need, actually, more investments like that in this country. What has happened in Bayelsa is... Uh, because we are very passionate about addressing the human condition. While it is good to build the roads and bridges and put down all the physical things and that people see, in the end, the issues remain about how we have made life more, more worth living for the human being. Education. And then healthcare is the next. Healthcare education. So we have built facilities for diagnosis that are world class. We have built hospitals with well, well I mean equipped, fully equipped. And unlike other states that are older, more cosmopolitan, that they have you know access to they can attract private investments in these areas private schools, private hospitals, and so on. Airports were built by federal governments for them. Here, I'm building an airport. The state is building an airport, 3.5 kilometers. So we are, as it were, scratching development from the rock in all spheres. Schools, hospitals, we have introduced, uh, to make these policies lasting, uh, we have introduced the Education Trust Fund, which is a levy, and we all pay. And that now has been created by law to fund this revolutionary intervention in education for the children of the poor, for everybody. No child left behind. The same thing for healthcare. After building and equipping these hospitals and facilities, we have created the health insurance fund, which we all pay. The state pays 5% of IGL into it every, every month. And these are all independently managed. They don't come to the governor. They're independently managed and have appointed very competent professionals and leaders in their own right in these fields to run them. And I'm very grateful that uh, we're receiving a lot of successes. Now poor people whose wives are giving birth, they no longer cry for support. Who are ill and their children, they no longer cry for support. They don't need to save money. They don't need to go begging. People don't need to die because they don't have money to pay for it. We have created all of this. And now, even with the challenges that we're having, the opposition, because you see, these are things we are creating from nowhere in the state. And uh, I expected some pushback. But now, uh, people are commending. They are now saying, ah, my wife wanted to give, I didn't have money. Thanks to Governor Dixon. Now, we're addressing mass housing. And from now till the end of this month and the remainder of my tenure, we're going to do a lot more in the area of housing. Mass housing, public housing for the poor, for the less privileged, for the low income dwellers. And for me, I take my mandate as a mandate for the people, the mandate to support the people. Um, now the other, initiative we are pursuing now is reforms of the public service to reduce inefficiencies and block wastages. My state has no business spending five point something billion paying non-existent workers, fraudulent grade levels, and all that. I've been talking about it, I've been sensitizing, and we've been doing a lot of periodic checks from 2012 till now. When I took over, 
uh, in 2012, the wage bill was almost six billion. A state like Bielsa, six billion. Now that was fraudulent, outright fraud. And it's not acceptable right now. I've set up various systems to reduce it. We are now at four billion at the state level, and still about 1.2 billion from the eight local government area. Now I still think that this can come down more. So I've unfolded the last leg of the public sector reforms, which is going on. I know that one or two people uh, will be affected. I'm sorry about that, but then I've got a job to do. We've got to sanitize the state for the future. All right, let's talk about some national issues. Uh, recently, the government, the federal government made a move to, uh, to withdraw about or allocate about $1 billion from the excess crude account. And the president said it is something he wants to use to fight uh, insecurity in the country. What's your position on that? Well, first of all, when this meeting took place, I wasn't there, but my state was represented. And I was briefed thereafter. But I had issues that I thought should be addressed. Because whereas um, we are political leaders to our level, and uh, irrespective of political party differences, my position has always been that there are two areas that all political leaders in our country must uh, accommodate one another and then form consensus on. These are firstly the issues of national security. And then the second issue is the national economy. Because these two are no respecters of persons. They, affect, they are like rain. When it rains, uh, it affects everybody. So on these two things. And my, my position is that maybe because of my background, my, 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 my strong views on law and order and on stability and security as a necessary condition for development, any meaningful development, I feel that we should support um, um, a system where if we all agree to equip our security forces, Number one, I don't want it to be designated as a fund for Northeast or fight against Boko Haram, no. But as a fund, as some support to equip our security forces, the military, the police, the SSS, and all of them. And I engaged the chairman of the National Economic Council, the vice president, chairman of the Governor's Forum. And my views are well known on this. Let's build consensus on the equipment needs Let's be satisfied about how this investment will affect the security architecture of my state, for example, which is maritime. And I know how much I'm spending to support security operations in my state. So I want to see platforms. So if we're talking of spending $1 billion, I want to see how many platforms will come to the Navy. I want to see how many platforms will come to the Joint Tax Force. I want to see how many platforms will come to the Marine Police. And all that and all that. But is the federal government ready to make all of those platforms well, well, open to well, all that governments? Is it, that is it. That no. is it. And then I said, look, the derivation element or component of this money has to be worked out and paid to the states in accordance with the Constitution. Because the excess crude account, the money that is there, is oil money. And the derivation principle applies to it applies to it. Now, if you don't do that, you'll be making oil producing states like my state to contribute twice. Because that derivation money, the statutory component of it, statutory allocation, they call it, that should have come to every state is what the non-derivation states are contributing. But we, the derivation states, would have contributed that and also our 13%. And I, I don't agree with that. Fundamentally, I'm opposed to that. And I've made my views known to the appropriate authorities. And I'm waiting for them to, um, to engage. I'm waiting for them to provide clarification on all these issues. Um, otherwise, my state has taken a decision to take appropriate actions. All right. Uh, talk to us also. Uh, the the Bayasa state government is uh, threatening to sue the federal government over 13% derivation. The money is that the states are supposed to use to develop and, and carry out its own developmental uh, 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 programs and projects. Talk to us about that. Well, there, there are also, you see, we, we practice in this country a very funny 
um, federal system. Uh, and these are the reasons some of us are passionate about the call for a restructured Nigeria, so that we can address these uh, challenges and imbalances and concerns. Um, but even within the existing constitutional framework that has made provisions for 13% derivation, the implementation of it does not really come to 13%, unfortunately. You have a situation where every state, including the oil-producing states, whereas we suffer the, 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 the adverse effects of all of this that is associated with oil production. Environment is gone, livelihoods are gone, societies are turned upside down, communities are in crisis, and all of this. Yet, every state, really, and even to some extent the federal government, is at the mercy of the NNPC. In other words, every month we, our officials go to FAC and they simply wait for NMPC to declare this is what is available and they throw that at us. So there has been a consistent, a consistent violation of the constitutional provisions regarding 13% constitutional provisions to the effect that all forms that accrue to the federal government should be paid to the federation account. You understand? So that it will be put in the distributable pool for uh, disbursement according to the, to, the, to the revenue sharing formula. That has been flagrantly disobeyed and violated over the years. It's not just one government, over the years. And we feel that that element of federalism, fiscal federalism, even within the existing constitutional framework, we should address it. Okay. We don't have all the time right now, but I can't uh, leave you to go without saying that when, at the end of your tenure, what legacy would you like to be remembered for in Bayasa State? Well, um, clearly my priorities are known. Priorities of my government, um, law and order and stability. Our state is now one of the most stable states, even within the Niger Delta, one of the most stable in Nigeria. That's a legacy that I think uh, should endure. Whoever comes should build on and improve um, because you can't have development in an environment that is insecure, that's unstable. Um, our investments in education, we're passionate about that because that's the tool that we can use to change our society. And it's already changing. So um, that has to be continued and improved upon. Um, our investments in healthcare need to be deepened and continued, and we are now introducing other uh, ideas and initiatives on the economy, because the economy is the other big thing. When you educate the people, they've got to have jobs to do. They've got to be in a position to function uh, and survive in, in an environment that is rewarding, in an economy. So we're building an airport, for example. Businesses need to come. We are trying our hands at a deep sea port. We need to have businesses there. We're building the, the uh, industrial park, eco-industrial park. We want to attract businesses. We're building a gas hub, a power hub. We want to use our abundant gas resources to generate power, to attract manufacturing, uh, and so on and so forth. So all these are things that, initiatives that we think, uh, that, um, uh, and we're confident that uh, uh, no matter, we, we will try to complete most of them. A uh, number of them are nearing completion. And uh, uh, we expect that there should be some continuity um, to follow through on these matters so that the people can have a full benefit of these investments and initiatives. All right. Your Excellency, uh, Executive Governor of Bayasa State, Dr. Sireke Dixon, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you, you for the great work you guys thank are doing you. in TVC. We wish you well. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Kick more. She's a
Mama, when you have been my big daddy, 